Well, that was the best drum roll I've ever had. It was the first drum roll I've ever had. I am in love with beach plastic. And my husband, he's here, and he's okay with it. <laughs> it all started when I went on vacation to Eleuthera, which is in the Bahamas, and I took my first beach walk. And as I'm walking along, I'm noticing these lines in the sand, like you can see here. They're made from the surf bringing in um, little seeds, coral, seaweed. And in between those lines are little pieces of plastic, brightly colored plastic. And when I first saw them, I thought, how pretty. And then I thought, well, they're not supposed to be there. And as I walked along the beach, I saw more and more plastic. And I got to a rocky cove at the end, and I climbed onto the coral rock. And in between all these rocks were wedged pieces of plastic. Everything that mankind had ever made in plastic was there. There were lawn chairs, there were crates, there were flip-flops, there were shoes, there were toys. There were endless lengths of plastic nylon rope. Now, I'm a fashion designer. I'm a designer. And everything I see, I look at as texture, as color, as material, as inspiration. And what I saw on that beach and in that cove that day was something I had never seen before. And I started picking it up. Because it had been in nature for so long that it had taken on a sense of nature. It had been sanded by the surf. It had been bashed against the rock. It had been exposed to the elements, to the sun, for so long that some of it looked like rock, like little gemstones. And I think my love hate relationship, as I picked it up, as you can see me picking it up right here, started in that very moment. Now, my family and I had fallen in love with the Luthra, the people, the beaches, and we kept coming back. And every time we came back, I collected more beach plastic. I became obsessed. I bought a macro lens so that I could take photographs that were literally this close to the plastic. I would fall to my knees like a worshiper walking along the beach when everybody else, the rest of my family, would be lying down with a book and sunblock, sunning themselves. I was manically walking along the beach, picking up the plastic, photographing it, and people would come up to me because I was so enthusiastic about what I was finding, they thought they were missing out on something. <laughs> and I would show them a piece of trash. And they would look at me, and I would say, I guess I suffer from plastophilia. <laughs> and I took all these bags full of plastic back to my studio near New York, where it piled up like a collection. I saw it as a collection. I wasn't thinking of really doing anything with it. At the same time, I was in a transformational period of my life. I'd been a fashion designer for 30 years. I'd worked for the big brands like Calvin Klein. I'd had my own brand several times. And I wanted more, or maybe I wanted less. I want, didn't want to be a part of the consumption of more any longer. And at the same time, I became acutely aware of my daily interaction with plastic. When I woke up in the morning, the first thing I did is touch my plastic alarm clock. I would go into the bathroom, I'd brush my hair, I'd brush my teeth, brush my eyelashes with plastic. I would go downstairs, I would unwrap endless amounts of food wrapped in plastic for my daughter's lunch boxes, only to rewrap it in plastic, put it in their plastic lunch boxes. And the rest of my day was a constant interaction with plastic. And I'm sure that after tonight, you will be more aware of your constant interaction with plastic. Now, this doesn't mean that plastic wasn't one of the great inventions of the last century. In fact, urban myth has it that Rockefeller said, 
I mean, his motto was, don't waste anything. And I often wonder what he would think about the nature of waste that has been spawned by plastic. And the advertisers at the time, 50 years ago, said, plastic is the material that will give nature a break. Because we've been depleting nature. We've been using too much wood, too much bone, too much ivory. But 50 years later, when each one of us uses 300 pounds of plastic a year, we are no longer giving nature that break. We're only recycling 7% of it. Eight million pieces of plastic end up in the oceans every single day. And the oceans are like the Earth's bloodstream. It gets everywhere. So as I became more aware of the hazardous influence plastic has on our planet, I started making things with my collection. I started by making earrings. And I wore them, and my friends liked them, so I would make them for my friends. And then my friends' friends liked them. So very slowly, a narrative around recycling, green, cleaning up beaches started to develop. Around that same time, we went back to Eleuthera for a whole month where friends of mine opened um, a shop called The Beach House, which was literally right on the beach where I first picked up my first pieces of plastic. And they asked me to create a collection for them. So I did a collection of jewelry, and I made one bikini, because I always had this fantasy of somebody wearing a bikini and lying in the sand right next to the pieces of plastic that I hadn't picked up yet, <laughs> coming full circle. So very slowly, I had this awakening to the possibilities of this material that had been thrown to this mythical place called Away. Right? <laughs> we all go there. And I started making things like the ones you see behind me. Now, around the same time, um, Barney's New York was, had an Earth Day competition. And I really missed um, making things out of fabric. So I started adding um, pieces of beach plastic to material. And I started with a collection of scarves. Now, as I was doing this, I was very aware that no matter what I did, I could never make a dent in the amount of plastic that washes up on every beach, every day, with every tide and every wave. So for the first time in my fashion career, I wanted to be copied. <laughs> in fact, the only way Plastic is Forever was going to succeed is if I was inspiring people to do the same thing I did. And this would be a new fashion paradigm. The fashion company that only succeed when it is being copied, right? So to that end, I went on tour around the Bahamas. This is Governor's Harbor. I went to Abaco. I went to Tarpon Bay. And I took local kids in groups of about 30 to 40 onto the beaches. And I showed them how to clean them up and how to take the best pieces that would make great jewelry. And at first they were like, eh, whatever. <laughs> but as they saw my tools, the things I made, and all the trimmings, the little silver trimmings I brought with me, they got into it. And once they got into it and they found kind of their inner great creativity, they started making these amazing collections like these kids. And they were proud of it. And it was just a transformational moment for everybody, for me and the material. And now we're talking about opening markets that are going to be selling the beach plastic jewelry that these kids are making to the people that are coming off the cruise ships, the tourists that are coming off the cruise ships. They stop in the Bahamas. Which means that when they take the plastic jewelry back to the cruise ship, 
Again, the plastic has come full circle because the cruise ships are known to be one of the biggest polluters of the Caribbean waters and around the Bahamas as well. So to go back to the Barney's competition, I entered with those scarves and plastic is forever won the best new green designer label. Now this was a case of be careful what you ask for because it also led to an order for 750 t-shirts, <laughs> all decorated with little pieces like this, which meant that I had to, in the end, get 100 pounds worth of plastic, one third of my personal annual consumption, I brought it down, <laughs> back to my studio here in Miami, in fact, my garage is not a studio at all, and cut them up into 40,000 little pieces and drill 100,000 holes. And uh, luckily I had a cottage industry of local Miami women help me with this. And the collection got into Vogue and Vogue called it Fantastic Plastic. And a local documentary about beach plastic called One Beach, which deals with the problems of beach plastic pollution, asked me to be in it. And I am here tonight, thank you. And I feel like I am exactly in the place where everything I have done with my life so far has come together in this work, where I can not only give back to local communities, but also tell people about the problems with plastic pollution. Now, this is my new collection. It's inspired by M. Miami. I have added bling. There are crystals, there are seed pearls. And when I arrived this evening, we did a rehearsal yesterday, I arrived this evening, and one of the tech guys said to me, oh, you from the affordable beach plastic. I'm going, it's not affordable. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I am flirting with the luxury market. Right, I was in Barney's. I want beach plastic to become the next designer material. Why not? It was Ray and Charles Eames, it was Werner Panton, it was um, George Nelson, who 50 years ago made plastic cool. Before that, it was just, you know, a commodity. So, why not have this next generation of designers turn a negative into a positive. Turn the design philosophy of the 50s on its head and say, let function follow form, the form of beach plastic. Why not? We can't get away from it. Much as we all like to, there's no getting away from it. We'd all like to look away, but how about seeing differently? There's no throwing away. There is no place called away. Or maybe away is here, the next cool place to be. And here, and here, and here. Thank you.